Good evening, I'm Ken Roy Batiste and welcome to this special live presentation of the Communal Cooperative Credit Union, a mini-series via Zoom dubbed Development Agenda 2020 Post-COVID-19 Impact and Opportunities. We're live on the Grenada Broadcasting Network, GBN Television, K105 FM and Hot FM, simultaneously on Real FM, Boss FM, Our Nation, Mikey Live, Government Information Service, GIS, now Grenada, Vibes FM, and Sister Isle Radio with uh, rebroadcasts on MTV and WeFM. All right, so the mini series started last evening, the 22nd of June, and focused on the psychosocial perspective. This evening, we continue the national conversation spotlighting the rural development perspective, extracting beauty from the ashes. Here's the panel. Dr. Dunstan Campbell, development sociologist and agricultural extensionist, and Dr. Stephen Fletcher, a professional whose career spans over 35 years in the private, public, and uh, not-for-profit sectors. Gentlemen, nice to see both of you. A very warm welcome. Warm well, welcome to you, Kenroy. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kenroy, and thanks for having me. Indeed. All right, so in a moment, we'll hear from Dr. Dunstan Campbell, but first, I'd like to tell you more about who he is. Dr. Dunstan Campbell is the holder of a BSc in Agriculture and a joint MSc in Agricultural Extension from the University of the West Indies and the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He also holds a doctorate in development sociology from the University of Montpellier, Paul Valéry in France. Most of his professional life was spent with the University of the West Indies as an outreach lecturer based with, in St. Lucia with responsibility for the Windward Islands. His final professional assignment was with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations based in Jamaica as resident representative with responsibility for Belize and the Bahamas. He has since retired, yes. At present, he is the president of the Grenada Organic Agriculture Movement, GOM, chair of the non-state actors panel for the 11th EDF and a member of the civil society movement in Grenada. He is an independent senator representing farmers and fisher folk in the Grenada Senate. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dunstan Campbell, he will present for the next uh, 15 minutes. We want to let you know as well that uh, he'll get a reminder when he has five minutes remaining. He'll also be reminded when he has one minute remaining. Dr. Campbell, we are all as. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Kenroy. And before I begin my presentation, I would like to take the, the opportunity to pre present to you a brief historical context of Grenada's rural development, highlighting some events that have shaped Grenada's rural development. Grenada rural development is embedded in the history of our colonial past which divided the economy in what was referred to as the modern sector and a traditional sector. The modern sector produced commodities for export, while the traditional sector produced commodities for local consumption. The plantation system was the prime mode of production in the modern sector. The plantations were owned by the white elites, and were designed to use prime lands to produce crops for Britain's industrial need. In the case of Grenada, because of its rolling terrain, the tree crops, tree crops were selected as, as the crops of, of choice, and they were nutmeg, cocoa, um, with, the, with the sugar in the flatland uh, in the southern part of Grenada. Traditional, uh, in the traditional sector, it was found on the periphery of the plantation, and that's very important. We see evidence of that today in the large farms 
that are, are still existing. And it had extraordinary little amenities to live and farm so as to produce food for the families. In fact, that was a strategy by the landlords to have easy access to farm workers and to reduce the maintenance cost of workers. There were no arrangements for, for the education of the workers. That construct led to the characterization or stigmatization of rural farm workers as being landless, illiterate, poor, and dependent on their masters. And you can see it, it lasts even today. Um, you will see that people will say that people from the country are what we've just said, you know, which is the characterization that has started way back be before emancipation. But within the traditional sector, that's important, the traits of resilience were cultivated. The workers mimicked the cultivation practice of the plantation system on their own plots and upgraded it in most cases. They managed, they changed the pure stand which was used on the plantation to mix crop um, um, farming on their own plots. A risk management strategy and they use pen manual. So right there we see that already some signs of um, organic farming, so to speak. There were also the beginning of cooperation among workers. The workers united in task, and they refer to it as the maroon, the maroon system. Communal savings, the susu, and generally survival technique because they had to survive because of difficulty, difficult conditions that they were um, placed. They also read, they also read, uh, read animals, um, especially livestock. And out of those conditions came the genesis of Grenada's food security system. This is very important. It started way back before emancipation with the workers or the, the, the slaves who came from Africa. Now I will give you some, um, take some periods between emancipation and COVID and uh, to show you some significant or to demonstrate some significant events that took place along the way, which have shaped the, um, our rural countryside and rural development in Grenada. The first period I'll take is the, the one which stretches from emancipation to independence. And one of the things that came out, the first one that I want to refer to is just after emancipation, we saw the beginning of the demise of the plantation. The prices for the commodities were falling, and because of bad management of the plantation, most of the, not most, some of the, the planters were not able to keep the farm, so they started to, um, to, give, to give it up, so to speak. We saw the estates were being bought by the indentured workers. And let me say a little bit about indentured workers. Indentured workers came after the space, and they came mainly from India, and they they came with contracts. So they they they, they worked on on the estate, um, completed the contract, and whatever the contract said, they were give, they were awarded either monetary or land. So they had an advantage over the Africans who got nothing after independence. There is also the. An important one here, the establishment of the Grenada Cocoa, Nut, the Grenada Cooperative Nutmeg Association. It was formed in, in 1947. And if we follow the news today, we'll see that it might not exist for very long, but this is not going to be part of this discussion today. We also saw the establishment of the Grenada Cocoa Association, but that's a bit later in 1964. And both cocoa and nutmeg associations were formed out of struggle of exploitation of the of the middlemen to um, uh, the exploitation of the middlemen. There was also in that period the struggle for workers' rights, and which was led nationwide by the charismatic Sir Eric Matthew Gary. And uh, in the period 1940-41, they saw 1951. Sorry. We saw the um, 
the 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 uprising, the the the, lay, the uprising that took place, and uh, um, uh, the famous um, um, phrase "sky red" was born out of that period. There, uh, we wouldn't say much about the sky red, but there was also in that same period the land for the landless program, and we see that um, Eric Matthew Gary his first attempt to have land reform in Grenada and to provide land to the landless. Um, there was, some of it went well, but we understand, but the, uh, some of it did not go well, but we had the land for the land program. Then we had the next period from independence to 1983, the invasion. And uh, I took out three, I highlighted three important things. In that period, we saw cooperatives in the development of rural life. We saw agro-processing and we saw youth in agriculture. These three areas are still with us today. The cooperatives, the agro-processing, and youth in agriculture, which should be addressed later on. Then I picked out the other, the other um, area from intervention, that's uh, to Ivan and Emily. And in that period, which was just after the Americans came in to, um, to end the situation that we had. You know, some people say revolution, others say intervention. I would use intervention in this case and maybe be able to say something about it if asked. But we had several projects that um, targeted the development of the main crops, cocoa and nutmeg. And we saw the um, cocoa rehabilitation project funded by the Canadians. We had the World Bank Agricultural Diversification. And you had the USA project, USAID project, the Agricultural Extension Project, Caribbean Agricultural Extension Project, of which I was part of this one, um, to strengthen the extension services in the, in, in the ministries of agriculture and, com and commodity boards and statutory boards. Then there was the, the intervention from Ivan to em, from Ivan and Emily to pre-COVID. Again, for the first time, I, I, I would like to say, for the first time we see focus on small farmers. The World Bank Small Farmer Rehabilitation Project was distributed where distribution of inputs took place. And then there is the FAO MOA Food Security Project against targeting small farmers. In fact, worldwide at this point in time, the literature and the, the, the move was to focus on small farmers because of their the, the importance in the, in the economy and rural development. So these projects reflected what was happening worldwide. Dr. Campbell, you have um, five minutes yeah. remaining. Yes, okay. Okay. So um, I'll go to post Emily, the rising from the ashes, Grenada's agricultural Pre-COVID was uh, struggling with the impact of Ivan and Emily and the effects of climate change on production and productivity. Several technical, um, several technical manpower shortages, severe technical manpower shortages in the Ministry of Agriculture, the lack of facilities. However, there were projects with tremendous potential to bring positive change to the sector, agriculture and science. These, these two are selected because they address root problems of the sector, the integration of small producers into the commercial sector, and in the case of SAEP, to utilize knowledge of climate smart agriculture to address marketing opportunities for the instance, for instance, the opportunity that tourism presents through the sinking of production and consumers and consumption in that sector. Given the threat that COVID presents in terms of shutting down the borders and, and leading to the loss of market and the inability and the inability to export in retrospect was not a serious problem for Grenada as with other countries because of it was because of its construct of having a modern sector which is export oriented and a traditional sector domestic production, which for the most part was invisible. In fact, um, when we look at uh, national statistics and we see the contribution of agriculture, most of that comes from the modern sector. So yes, the export market suffered and, will, and, and had tremendous losses, but food security during the period of COVID was secured because of the, 
of the traditional sector, which was invisible, which started in the days of, this, uh, of slavery by this, the African slaves up to today, and, um, uh, and, is, and, and in fact, um, is not being targeted and, and, and as, as that of the, the other sector, which is the export um, or the modern sector. But there are ongoing projects that offer opportunity to farmers and fishers to access to reduce the economic impacts of COVID. For instance, there is the poultry project. There is rich tree project. In most cases, COVID year, uh, these projects would be necessary, but they are not sufficient. Um, in going forward, other interventions must be made to address the institutional weaknesses that exist to support a resilient agriculture and efficient and fishery sector and developmental needs of rural community. To conclude, I see in all the turmoil, turmoil of the, a new beginning, one that I would I would like to refer to as the quiet revolution, which would be led by the returnees from the private and public sector into the rural sector, youth, women, and of course, existing dedicated farmers. I see that revolution extending to women in terms of food crop production and agro-processing. In fact, the 2012 census showed that there are 265 um, agro-processing units in Grenada employing um, part-time 1,300 plus workers. So it is an, a very important sector led by women. I would see new, um, in, in new marketing arrangement, internet marketing of local produce. And the, I, I see also the Ministry of Agriculture embracing change with new technologies to reach the, reach the farming and fish, the fishing communities, ICT and those and, and, and other intervention to reach to reach our farmers in difficult areas. You have one minute. But to do all this, sir? one minute yeah. remaining. But to, but to do all this, there must be enlightened leadership throughout the system. I thank you for the 15 minutes. I, it's a rush presentation, but I think I got through most of what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. 14 minutes. Um, you have um, literally taken to get across your presentation to us. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunstan Campbell, development uh, sociologist and uh, agricultural extensionist. Quite a mouthful there for us to chew on. On that note, we uh, take a break. This is Development Agenda 2020 post-COVID-19 Impact uh, and uh, Opportunities brought to you by the Communal Cooperative Credit Union. Coming up from us, we'll also hear from Dr. Stephen Fletcher on the rural development perspective, extracting beauty from the ashes. Get some water if you must and be back with us. Stay close. Communo, we are adapting to meet the changing needs of our shareholders and members. Times are changing, and with the changing times comes a whole new way to do business. Our parents may have done their banking a different way. Communal's state-of-the-art online banking and international debit card allows members to do business with great ease. It's like literally having a branch in your very own hands. Need a loan? Apply online from the comfort of your own home anywhere in the world and your request will be dealt with remotely. Want to transfer between your accounts or another shareholder? No wait time for transactions to update. Voila! Who needs receipts when you can receive them via e-statements on your mobile device and save the environment? Not a communal member? You can join our family today by applying online. At Communal, we see you working hard to ensure that you save, invest, and grow. Communal, join us today. This will be the best financial decision you have ever made. Where can you find courage and positive thinking as we forge forward and triumph over pandemic woes? Where can you get a head start, a financial start, or a restart? Lock on to Agenda 2020 with Communal Cooperative Credit Union, the mini-series on radio and television. 
let's look at perspectives, poverty reduction, possible startups, new ideas, and financial possibilities. Let's hear from local and international thinkers on development, focused on you. Tune in to all major radio and television stations from June 22nd to the 25th, from 8.35 to 9.35 p.m. nightly. Agenda 2020 with CCCU on all major radio and television stations, 8.35 to 9.35 p.m. nightly with Communal. Prepare for impact. Welcome back. You are part of a special live presentation of the Communal Cooperative Credit Union, a mini-series via Zoom dubbed Development Agenda 2020 Post-COVID-19 Impact and Opportunities. This evening, the focus is on the rural development perspective, extracting beauty from the ashes. The next speaker is Dr. Stephen Fletcher a distinguished and accomplished professional whose career spans over 35 years in the private, public and not-for-profit sectors. His academic career includes Doctor of Philosophy in Management, Ashton University, England, Master in Business Administration, Middlesex University, England, Advanced Diploma in Management, West London College, Association of Business Executives, ABE, Diploma in Business Administration, City of London College, Association of Business Executives, ABE, and Diploma in Marketing Studies, London School of Accountancy, Chartered Institute of Marketing, CIM. Now, Dr. Fletcher is a proud son of rural Grenada, having born and been raised in the village of Concord. His consciousness of rural and national development started while he was still a secondary school student. While, having, uh, while being a student at the Institute for Further Education and president of the National Students' Council, he organized some young men in the village of Concord and led the formation of the Concord Youth Cooperative. Since then, Dr. Fletcher remained an ardent thought leader and policy advocate on community and rural development, not-for-profits, and cooperatives. His career spans academic policy development and analysis, as well as rural development. He taught at Aston uh, University and Middlesex University in the UK, St. George's University, the University of the West Indies Open Campus, and the Institute for Further Education, IFE, now T.M. Marishal Community College. Dr. Fletcher served as Grenada's ambassador to the European Union as well as bilateral ambassador to many European states and the United Nations based in Europe. He also served as ambassador-designate to the People's Republic of China. Plus, he served on the boards of directors of the Grenada Cooperative Nutmeg Association, GCNA, Grenada Public Service Cooperative Credit Union, Arisa, and the National Development Foundation. Finally, Dr. Fletcher works as an independent consultant with Campesh International Consultancy Incorporated. Dr. Fletcher will present for 15 minutes as well. Welcome, sir, to the discussion once more. Good evening, Dr. Fletcher. Feel free to go ahead. All right, so Dr. Thank you. I think I'm now on mute. Yes, you are. We're hearing you clearly. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Um, let me first begin by thanking the Communal Cooperative Credit Union for inviting me to be part of this really important and inspiring discussion, um, one that is quite appropriate for this period. I also want to thank um, my colleague, Dr. Dunstan Campbell, for uh, laying the, the groundwork for what I have to say and for setting the context and peace for this evening's discussion. And certainly to thank your viewers and listeners as well who, uh, who have joined us. Um, some of the things I'm about to say may collaborate with what uh, Dr. Campbell has said, but I'll try to avoid as much as possible so we do not have duplication. 
So let me first begin by exploring this whole concept of development and specifically rural, rural development, um, which basically emerged in a post-slavery environment. And uh, take all that Dr. Campbell has said into consideration. I'll quickly add that we have defined over time development um, to exclude the very human being. Um, we have defined development as, uh, or we have come to understood development to really be seen in terms of physical things, buildings, infrastructural works, glitziness. Um, so the whole development paradigm for most people has been seen in the broad context of the extent to which you have this infrastructure that is all glitzy and, and, and glamorous and so Technically, we have defined it in terms of the gross domestic product as a measurement of the goods and services that are produced in a country, and certainly in this case, we need it from time to time. And really and truly, up until recently, if that is a true measurement, development ought to have taken place, as we know it, in the rural community, where the agricultural sector was fundamentally the driving um, backbone of the Grenada economy up until probably Hurricane Ivan, um, post the Hurricane Ivan period when tourism emerged as the, the, the strongest pillar of our economy. But I would like to refine development as being one that focuses on people and communities, one that looks fundamentally at the quality of life in them, looks at our, our health, our longevity as human beings and as people, um, or access to education. So those things that really define the quality of life is what I like to redefine this development, ability to hold jobs, ability to climb the socioeconomic ladder, and so forth, is what I, will, I really like to, to, to see. And, and to redefine development in this context and, and going forward. Because we have come full circle, really, and COVID-19 has really brought it out in a very significant way, where the sustenance of Grenada during that period, and I think Dr. Campbell has in fact referenced that, um, our sustainability rested largely on the uh, performance of the agricultural sector, and that means the rural community. It is the rural farmers in this period who really saw us through this very challenging period. And therefore, in the context of, of development, we have to refocus our mindset and see development as being reflected in what happens nationally and not necessarily what happened in, 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 in particular certain parts of the island. So, we have to see, see it in that, in that context. Now, in rural communities, I will say, um, I want to highlight a, a social aspect here of development, which is the role of the smaller shops and the role of the junctions, the four roads. Those were cross cuttings that took place physically, but also had a very strong, powerful psychological impact and social impact, where people gathered, where people traded goods and services and so forth, where discussions were held and where things happened. To a large extent, in fact, last night, uh, discussion was very insightful, where, um, where the, the, the psychologists and I also think the manager of the, of the communal credit union emphasized the importance of the thinking, the thinking process. And what we think is what we eventually act out and what we become. And the junction and the small shops, especially the rum shops in the rural communities, played a significant role in influencing behavior and influencing what happened. Uh, much more could be said on that later on. But in terms of our rural economy and our rural, the ruralness of the Grenadian society, we were defined, and I, I want to, to and three critical aspects. We are defined by one, our demographics. 
terms of our population makeup, and more so our gender, the divide in, in, in gender, and how that played out over time. Um, employment, and where employment came from. So from a demographic point of view, you had rural communities that was largely um, almost an, an even split of 47, 50% in terms of the gender makeup and population size. And employment that was generally driven on the land. The majority of employment at various stages in our development resided in the rural communities. Until the last three or so decades, where we saw a shift in where rural people, in order to uh, make a, to, 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 to really survive from an economic perspective, had to move. And I will talk about that urban drift later on, had to move into the urban areas to find jobs and so forth, as the, is the client. The economic structure, I think, of the rural, e the rural economy is also very important for us to focus on at this time and for us to develop perspectives on the way forward. The economic structure was largely characterized by, I will say, a um, large number of micro and small businesses, mainly in the agricultural and fishing sectors, but also in the craft industry and some services. Agriculture played a leading role, both the traditional agriculture, I just call it the non-traditional, has been referred to sometimes as the modern, uh, modern ag agricultural products. Fishing was also dominant. In fact, if you were to look on the West Coast, um, after we passed Grand Mall from Woodford all the way up to Guav, Sotez, um, fishing is one of the dominant, or probably worse, one of the dominant sectors of rural economic life in this country. You had it in, in Concord, in Grand Roy, Palmas, Guav, Victoria, Sotez, St. Andrews. Fishing played a very significant role. Um, and our, our ruralness was defined by that. In fact, we know Guav is the fishing, the, the fishing town of, of Grenada. Craft items was also significant. We look at uh, subis and so in those areas that had defined the economy in those countries. In fact, now that we are talking about sustainable materials and non-degradables and so forth, um, those places, I think between Marquis and Subis, were areas where people use um, the straw, I can't remember the name of that particular straw now, to make bags and so forth in the past. There was a thriving industry, and that helped define the economy of rural Grenada. On the social side, very important. Historically, your ruralness, because coming out again of the, the plantation system and the ability of many of the, uh, the, the, the African people of African descent and so forth to purchase land or to lease or rent land, we built up a very strong sense of self-reliance. That was something that defined many role for. Self-reliance, a sense of independence, a, a sense of sustainability of ourselves because we can work the land, go get some fish, um, go to the river, catch some crayfish and so on. Um, we can work in our nutmeg pools, our cocoa processing stations. We work on the land for someone and we also work to our land. And it was not unusual in rural communities to find one household owning and or working two and three pieces of land at the same time Dr. while Dr. having Dr. other jobs, even me. when they have to go to St. George's to find white collar jobs and so forth. So those are the sorts of characteristics that we have of the structure of rural economy. And I wouldn't repeat some of the things that was that was there. Before. Just a reminder, Dr. Uh, Fletcher, five minutes remaining, just a reminder. Go great. ahead. Thank you very much. So what has, what has happened over time is that we have found that there has been a certain, there have been some structural changes that have occurred over time as represented by the shift in our gross domestic product. If we were to look at the composition of our GDP today, we'll see that it's fundamentally driven by tourism. Agriculture, 
is playing a secondary role in driving the economy. And therefore, if agriculture declines, the rural economy declines. Because of that divide that has taken place between the, the brightness of town and the glitzer and the development taking place and what was happening in the rural, the rural, the rural community. So today we see that there is a slow economic, there is economic decline. There is a rural, uh, there is um, dependency on organizations that, have, that, has, that has developed. We see communities now that are limited in terms of access to training and development in rural communities. And fundamentally, that deficit, that access to resources and so on in rural, rural Grenada has led to what's been defined as the urban drift, where people leave rural communities and come down to the south. COVID, however, there was a, 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 an interesting social dynamics I see played out in COVID, where many of the persons who moved from the rural communities into St. George's and especially in the south, where all the so-called development was taking place in terms of construction work that's been driving this economy and so on, people have really, uh, so because people moved down when COVID hit, a number of folks went back into the rural communities. They went back home. There were friends and colleagues I knew. When I was finding out about them, they were back in their rural communities because that's where they find comfort, they find community, they find family, they find food. Um, the way forward, we have to really think of a number of things. How much we, we, we need to encourage local communities to take charge of their development. And I have been thinking through a model that can be used to ensure that local communities govern their localness, govern their geographies, and take charge of their own development. But this cannot happen in the absence of strong government policies a government policy that has a strong rural development component. That has to underline a lot of this, 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 this project. There are rules for organizations to play, not this government, but for example, the NGO community. The NGOs are deeply rooted in local communities. They are aware, they know those communities, they know the people, and they have a significant role to play. The cooperative department, has a significant role to play in this time as we address issues of unemployment and so on, and really fundamentally addressing how we can transform this country. How can we make it a better place for all of our people, current and future generations? We have to redefine it. And I think that the cooperative sector has a significant role to play in that transformation. As a consequence, there will be partnerships between private sector, public sector organizations, the NGO community, and so on. Um, that is very, very important. There are opportunities in the rural, the rural communities, um, but there must be interventions as well. Not interventions in terms of handouts, but interventions in handing up, interventions in helping people to assert themselves to assert and take control of their resources and to use those resources for the development of those, those communities. Um, the role of technology in rural development, especially in agriculture, must be mentioned. Incubators to really hatch and farm out businesses it is very critical. As I mentioned, the issue of technology I do not mean it only in the sense of wires and coding and computers. But some of us may be old enough to recall during the revolution, uh, there was a gentleman, I think, from St. David's, and I could be corrected here, Dr. Campbell might be, might be aware of that story as well, or as well as the listeners and viewers. Just before that gentleman, proceed, Dr. Fletcher, you have the, one minute remaining, the, just before you proceed. Solution, thank you. Um, there were the cocoa beetle. And the solution to cocoa beetle was not chemicals. It was the use of some um, wooded tree that was found and was used to make the beetle track. This is a piece of technology that provides for the sustainability of lives and livelihood. In ending, I want to say this, that in my perspective of rural development, we have to focus on lives and livelihoods in tandem. 
We got to build the balance. We got to find ways to to to, to basically catapult a model that seeks to revive the rural economy, but more so to revive rural life. Um, I think I will end at this point and um, take questions as and when the time falls you. Right. Thank you very much. Indeed. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Fletcher, a professional whose career spans over 35 years in the private, public and uh, not-for-profit sectors. All right, so we've heard from both speakers on the rural development perspective, extracting beauty from the ashes. You're watching and listening to uh, Development Agenda 2020 post-COVID-19, Impact and Opportunities, a special mini-series of the Communal After the break, you two can chime in with your questions and or comments. We're so looking forward to your participation. We'll be right back. Yes. Experience life with your Communal Visa International Debit Card. Enjoy the benefits of hassle-free and stress-free shopping at your favorite restaurants or stores. Access your money 24 hours through the ATM anywhere in the world. Your Communal Visa International Debit Card is simpler, faster, and the most secured way of doing business. Your life, your card. Get the Communal Visa International Debit Card experience. The Communal Cooperative Credit Union to grow with us, save with us. All right, we're back here. We're live. The line is open 4401252. You can also connect with us by way of social media, specifically the Facebook page of the uh, Grenada Broadcasting Network, GBN Television, as well as the YouTube account of the Grenada Broadcasting Network. So feel free to chime in and uh, participate, of course, in this national conversation. In the meantime, uh, I want to start the conversation off. And, uh, you know, so much has been expressed here this evening from doctors uh, uh, Fletcher and uh, Campbell. And, and I, I, I note particularly uh, the, the expression as it relates to youth and agriculture. We'll come back to that, but for now, we have a caller online who wants to chime in. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, welcome. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question for Dr. Dun Campbell. Um, Dr. Campbell gave a beautiful um, perspective and overview. Um, rather scholastic and quite informational. Um, I have a question, though. Are there two strategies he can suggest for development of the country through rural enterprise? What two strategies can he suggest during this COVID time for the country to engage in via rural development? Thank you. Okay, very well. Dr. Campbell? Yes, Dr. Campbell, are you there? You're watching yes, development? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay, so yeah. uh, did you hear the question? Yes. Okay. Um, one strategy that um, I would like to refer to is that of the formation of groups, um, product productive alliances, as they are called, where um, um, five or 10 persons might decide to produce a commodity. Um, no one can in that group can produce sufficient to really hold a market. They come together and they unite and they produce a commodity. That's one strategy, the um, cooperative way. The other strategy is um, that I would like to um, propose is, well, it's an individual one, but one where there's specialization, where you alone may have something that is patentable and you decide to produce it, but you work with financial institution to hold your hand. In fact, um, um, Dr. Fletcher talked, um, referred to the incubator. And I think that there's something that can be used not only for the youth, but as a general principle of introducing um, whether you are young, middle-aged, to, um, to the business world. So the, these are the two um, strategies that I would um, you know, like to propose to you. Group formation and going through um, uh, incubation for something that is special to you. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Another call online. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Kenroy Batiste, and good evening to your guests, Dr. Dunstan Campbell and Dr. Stephen Fletcher. I must um, again applaud the Communal Cooperative Credit Union for this wonderful initiative in having these discussions. And I have, I was able to listen to both speakers and with the limited time that was given to them, they were able to really give a comprehensive account of, um, in the area of, um, of, of the rural economy. Um, I want, one thing that I took note of is what Dr. Dunstan Campbell said in regard to um, three areas or three pillars of the economy. I think that had to do during the, the um, revolutionary period. I'm not sure. I think so. And he spoke about um, the introduction of cooperatives, agro-processing, youth in agriculture. And um, I would like to ask a question to um, either Dr. Dunstan Campbell or Dr. Stephen Fletcher. Um, from what they have said, it seems that um, that we have really, really um, drifted very, very to a very, very great extent from the foundation that was laid during that period. I know you find agriculture seems to be something that is no longer um, in existence as it should be. So, is there any hope for agriculture? Okay. It, no. All right. Is there a is, is there, there any a, hope was, for agriculture at the moment? I'm missing that word. Is there a, something? Is there any hope? Any hope? Yes, for agriculture. Um, yes, I would like to start off by saying yes, there is hope, and there. The, um, and if I were to go through again those three points, um, agro processing, this is a silent revolution. In fact, um, when I, I came across the data of the 265 agro-processors in Grenada employing 1,300 plus workers, I, I, I was amazed, you know. And in fact, the Grenada is regarded as the um, agro-processing capital of the world. But um, that, that in itself is good, but it has some weaknesses in that uh, in a small country like this and the type of products that are being produced, it, is, it might be much better to go to the next stage, which is the cooperative stage. Right, uh, there are certain um, persons who will not want to give out their, their, their patent. But the question is, are you reaching that market? Do you have the, the resources in terms of raw material, financial material to, to, to reach uh, and to really de develop the, uh, the product that you, you have, you have um, discovered? So um, yes, there, there is, there is um, hope. But the strategy must must change. Uh, we we have to go back to what, um, the early days where we trusted one another, where we cooperate um, co cooperated with, with each other, and we got things done. So I think hope, yes, cooperation um, must also be a key part in that in in that um, achieving um, what you really want. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's my response to that person's. Um, Okay, very well. Another caller joins us. Good evening. Hi, good evening. How are you? Very well, sir. Uh, great. I just want to chime in quickly on the, on the program. Uh, I noticed a lot of discussion has been held regarding the youth in agriculture. And uh, one of the fundamentals, if, my, if, I, if I may say, is that of science and technology and the whole advent of um, education in agriculture. I know we have... Uh, a technical training institute that has been established, as far as I understand, during the revolution, um, called the Farm School. What do you both gentlemen think of that institution and what sort of uh, use that, that this institution can be put into um, to really chart the way forward for youth in agriculture and technology in agricultural production and agribusiness as a whole? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And both of you can chime in briefly on that. Let's begin with Dr. Fletcher. Youth and agriculture. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is absolutely necessary. Uh, let me start off by saying this, that um, we need to find the stimulants to get the youth committed and driven in, agri in agriculture. I, however, I do not believe, 
as most people do, or some people, that the youth do not want to get into agriculture. As I travel around Grenada, the length and breadth of Grenada, I'm seeing a lot of young people that are engaged in agriculture, whether it's in poultry, whether it's in livestock, whether it's uh, farming short crops. But what we need to do, we need to set up the mechanism and the infrastructure to facilitate that greater participation into the agricultural sector. So where it starts from? It starts from, it might be revitalizing the, what used to be called the Maribel Farm School, institutions of learning. And it doesn't have to be brick on wall these days. It can be virtual as we are doing now and as we have been forced into since COVID. Because you see, last night the point was made again, whatever we do, start with the belief system. What do we believe in? Do we believe that we can transform this country through agriculture? Do we believe that young people, that the youths of this country has the capacity or the ability or the potential to transform this country? I say yes. Let's, let's go back historically and bring it up to today. There are groups of young people that are willing to make this transformation. The Maribel Farm School, interestingly, while a student at the IFE, I had the opportunity to visit that school on a number of occasions. And in fact, today I see former students from that school who are heavily involved in agriculture. The use of the technology in agriculture is also critical. And here is where the incubator system comes in. But this is where other low-level technologies can be applied to agriculture. What's called labor serving, labor serving, serving rather, devices that can help ease the physical pressure of work, that can assist. And most importantly, any individual who is thinking of getting into a business sector, they are driven, among other things, by the profitability of that sector. Once it can be demonstrated that agriculture presents income for persons, a good return on their investment, it will be one of the major driving forces for agriculture. But we also get it, have to get it to the other level, the agro-processing, the tertiary levels. That's what we need to get it to. But in order to get it there, we need the raw material. We need production on the farm. And we have to find a system that is organized, that is well-structured, and so on. There is the Agricom project that is unfolding at this point in time, and that is, is, is pretty good. It's going to be of some help, but it's not enough. We need the private sector to review how they perceive investment in value added in agriculture. We need the cooperative sector, and especially credit unions. Credit unions need to think more of investing into that sector, because truth been told, the commercial banks have not done very well in that regard. Financial institutions generally have to relook their, 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 their focus on agriculture and agro-processing. But let me put it that way, agribusiness, right? So I have hope, and I think that um, with the proper leadership, the proper system in place, the proper infrastructure, we can, we can do it. We can make that transformation. And when I say leadership here, I'm not only talking about political leadership, I'm talking about policy leadership. I'm talking about business leadership. I'm talking about community-based leadership. I'm talking about a partnership, a national Grenadian partnership for development. Okay. okay. Very well. I want to give uh, Dr. Campbell a chance to respond to that. So, uh, Dr. Campbell... It's a fact. Young people are in agriculture. The question is, how can we get them to be more involved, more young people doing great things, being more productive relative to the sector? What is your proposal for this? All right. So we, we weren't able to hear Dr. Campbell at this time. Let's go back to the phone line to welcome the, uh, the next caller. Good evening. Hi, good afternoon. Good evening. Yes, sir. Um, good night to the panelists and the host. And my question is, do you think that there is a role for the MNIB in this development agenda? And if the answer is yes, what would the MNIB have to do to be able to play that role in a meaningful way? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Campbell, we want you to take this one. Um, do you think the MNIB has a role in the development agenda and specifically how can it play a part? Dr. Campbell, you have to unmute. I believe he's unable to hear me. Yeah. Okay, yes. so the question yes. is, do you think the MNIB has a role in the development agenda and specifically how can it play this role? The answer again is yes. And I think that the area where it can be most useful to the farmer is having a production planning and um, um, a focusing system and a pricing system that, that um, the farmers can understand. Most farmers would like to, to, to sell the produce or to have to do business with MNIB, but they, they cannot understand the pricing structure. And MNIB, even though it is right or wrong, MNIB, MNIB has been reluctant in the past to explain the pricing structure, structure to farmers. But it is well positioned. It has the, the storage capacity. It has the, 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 the standards, um, the, um, the HACCP requirement that is met for, for, for upscale marketing. And it has extension officers now. So it has the necessary... Um, um, structures in, in, in the necessary structures to do the job that is needed in the agricultural sector. But the, the factor which is, is really causing the problem is that the meeting of MNIB and the farmers to explain cost and pricing. Okay. And I think that MNIB would be a good aggregator. In fact, it might be the best aggregator once you can sit down and do that. And MNIB still has the function of providing input. Um, um, the last ex the last uh, uh, venture they had with the butternut squash is one where they have been guided, they have been misguided. In fact, you had a contract to produce butternut squash. You, you have missed the first stage by doing the experiment to see what varieties that uh, can be produced and what are the challenges before you de-roll it outside to, 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 to the farmers. And they did not do very well because so when they they, they, they rolled the, the 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 project, they found out that the the size of the the, the butternut squash was not the one that the market are asking for, and you know they they have to establish strategic relationship with with the ministry, with Cardi, and with others that are capable of uh, assisting them. Their role, they are the marketing expert. They are not the market. They are not the expert in other areas, and they should look for for advice and, and assistance. Thank you. Okay, very well. We have the final caller uh, joining us. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Congratulations to Brother Dunstan and Brother Stephen um, for a wonderful presentation. I want to interject um, two basics. Um, fundamentally, with all what we are doing to we have to appreciate that in Grenada and on planet Earth, people must eat. And this must become a fundamental principle in the thinking of our children and of our people. We must be able to produce some or most of the things we eat. Additionally, too, we have to be very mindful of the things that are waste, wasting here. We, we, we do not maximize even the minimum resources we have, and lots of things go to waste. So to Brother Campbell and um, Brother Stephen, how do you see us conceptualizing and dealing fundamentally with that principle of maximizing and optimizing use and reducing waste, as well as producing quality products. Great, fantastic. Thank you, sir. Mm. All right. So let's go to Dr. Fletcher. How do you think we can, of course, reduce waste and maximize in the, at the same time? Well, you know, I think this last caller um, really hit at the very core of the issue um, in terms of our national collective ability uh, to grow what we should be eating 
um, and to and to reduce waste overall. Let, let me let me just expand on this a bit. I think he's absolutely correct in pointing that one of the first responsibilities we have is to feed ourselves. COVID-19 has demonstrated that absolute need and that absolute requirement without a shadow of a doubt. We have survived in this country over time by our ability to feed ourselves by our small rural farmers. If we were to go back in time, the historical period, for example, of the strikes in the 1970s, when cargo boats and so were not able to come in, when there was uh, the stevedo strike. So we survived largely from the land because we were able to produce sufficient to feed ourselves. In this crisis, again, we have seen that we have demonstrated the ability by, of local farmers to produce food. Um, but production is one thing. Total accessibility of the food is another issue. So we need to do a couple of things. We need, to, we need to get this land bank going. We need to get the land use policy in place, right? Where we are going to uh, basically um, better manage the transition of agricultural land into residential land and residential property, where lands that should be put into agriculture have been used for real estate development. That's, it. That's one of the first things we have to put in place for maximizing the land. Secondly, we have to make a commitment, a national commitment to feed ourselves. And certainly, the revolution, in my view, has a, a, a blueprint, develop a blueprint that still needs to be pulled out, dusted, adjustments made to it, and get going. And that leads to this third point, the third issue of the agro-processing and the agro-processing sector. At the moment, yes, we have over 265 agro-processors in this country. We need to aggregate them. We need to focus their productive capabilities, improve on their marketing, their standard, their quality, to feed ourselves, but also for export. We need to be able to export something. We need to become productive. Hurricanes Ivan and Emily and COVID-19 has absolutely demonstrated to us the, the, the weakness of our current economic strategy that is hinged on tourism and on import. We need to demand in that context that organizations like the Produce Chemist Laboratory be really focused on working with cooperatives and private individuals in new product development. They need to be mandated, in fact, to that every year, Produce Chemist Lab should tell the nation that, look, we have produced or we have developed X number of new products. X is in the marketplace. We have formulation for others that the private sector or the cooperative sector can invest in mm -hmm. and get going. Yes. If by so doing, yeah. I think we'll be expanding the use of our lands, we'll be expanding the food production, and we'll be reducing, reducing waste of large quantities of our agricultural based products that are now going down the drain. Right. And these are not products that are going down the drain, it's income that needs to be used in our health sector, in our education sector, in our social services sector. Yeah. So every time we, we see this average. stage, we do for what the we are seeing is lost revenue. Yeah. I know there's so much, so much to express on this uh, very important topic. I mean, you've said 265 agro-processors in Grenada. Dr. Campbell also yes, said that's Grenada correct. is known as the agro-processing capital, you said, uh, Dr. Campbell of the world? Yeah, the agro process of the uh, Wimwood Islands, I think. But it seems <laughs> as if, you know, like there's a disconnect because there, there, there are so many agro-processors, but not much perhaps is being seen relative to large-scale production. But we'll take the final break and come back in a while. Stay yeah. close. The Communal Cooperative Credit Union Limited now gives you another reason to save and grow with us with our new and convenient Grand Dance Business Center. 
Located at the Grand Anne Shopping Center, it offers not only easy access and parking, but also an expanded small business advisory service, so we can help you build your business dreams into successful enterprises. Personalized service, advice and convenience, savings and business made easy. Opening hours, Mondays to Thursdays, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and Fridays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Communal, be a part of this new experience. All doors are open to all. All right, we're at the tail end now, the final part of this uh, special live presentation of the Communal Cooperative Credit Union. Of course, this is via Zoom. We've been talking the rural development perspective, extracting beauty from the ashes. Uh, Dr. Stephen Fletcher is with us, along with uh, Dr. Dunstan Campbell. We're into closing remarks at this time. I know there's so much to talk, so much to express on this all-important topic. Uh, but let's get some closing remarks uh, from each of you as uh, we put a wrap uh, to this uh, conversation. Let's go, Dr. Fletcher. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, in closing, I, I would just like to place on, on the table uh, three or four critical elements of pillars that I see that constitute a programmatic platform for rural development going forward. The core of it really hinges on collaboration, on partnership. So I think firstly, we need to have a cohesive policy on rural, rural development. One that is rooted in people, rooted in communities, rooted in lives and livelihoods of our people as a nation, that puts our people first and foremost, that seeks to embolden our people to have the confidence, the self-confidence to own this country, to own the lands, to own the properties, to take risk, to invest in businesses, and to invest in the future of this country. Second pillar, as part of this partnership arrangement, we need to invest in building capacities at the local level that gives local people the opportunity to form organizations social and economic organizations for the furtherance of that community. In that respect, I think the role of cooperatives is mm -hmm. very, very important. We need to build on that. The third pillar, I, I would say, is, is hinges on building leadership capacity as well. So we build economic, we build leadership capacities. Where we get go into we change the whole model of community intervention, where we go into these communities now, we intervene, but we build, we allow the community to build a capacity. Let us find out the leaders in, this, in these areas. Okay. The, the financial strength, the economic strength, and come up with a model that will drive these communities from the bottom up, rather than top-down development. Let's get the people involved and get them rich. And, and finally, the role of the financial institution. They must relook the way that they finance the development of this country. All right. Very well. Okay. Four yes. points there. Now to Dr. Campbell. Closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, Kenroy. And again, I would like to thank the, co the Communal Credit U Cooperative Credit Union for bringing us together. And uh, for me, I have learned a lot listening to uh, my colleague, Dr. Fletcher. And yes, I think that in going forward, we need to identify who would be the players to take us in the future. I think we should look to the youths, we should look to women, and we should look to returnees. And I like to spend a little time on this returnees that people um, who have gone, who have left the countryside, gone to um, to St. George's or, or, or um, the United States or wherever, but are back now and have joined the, the ranks of the agriculturists. Um, in fact, I had a discussion with someone um, recently and we were talking about the age. We were saying that the agriculture agriculturists are, are old people. But when you look at the returnees, the, the retired policemen, the retired uh, um, 
bus driver, the retired bank club. And these people are coming back to the agricultural um, sector with some skills that were not there and critical skills to lead development of that sector. So I think with these people, with the young, with the high tech, with the women, with the knowledge and, and the way of working and doing things that are different from, from, from men, and with the, with the skills of the returnees, I think that we can build a, a sector that it would be robust and sustainable and would be, and we, we as Grenadians would be proud of. So I thank you very much again, Ken Roy, yes. and um, the Community Credit Union for having us here tonight. Thank you. So yes, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunstan Campbell. And of course, uh, Dr. Stephen Fletcher. Thank you, gentlemen. We've been talking the rural development perspective, extracting beauty from the ashes, all part of uh, the mini series uh, Development Agenda 2020 uh, Post COVID 19 Impact and uh, Opportunities. Tomorrow, of course, we will continue this uh, conversation with the economic perspective, focus on small businesses. We'll have with us on the panel. Minister Oliver Joseph and uh, Stefan Benjamin of the Grenada Investment Development Corporation. So plan, of course, to join us for this broadcast. What a conversation. So much to express and make sense of. Uh, moving the economy forward is the agenda, is the focus of the Communal Cooperative Credit Union. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in to this special and uh, we invite you to tune in again tomorrow. And of course, the series will wrap up on Thursday, the 25th of June. That's it for now. I'm Ken Roy Batiste. Good night. Where can you find courage and positive thinking as we forge forward in triumph over pandemic woes? Where can you get a head start, a financial start, or a restart? Lock on to Agenda 2020 with Communal Cooperative Credit Union, the mini-series on radio and television. Let's look at perspectives, poverty reduction, possible startups, new ideas, and financial possibilities. Let's hear from local and international thinkers on development focused on you. Tune in to all major radio and television stations from June 22nd to the 25th, from 8.35 to 9.35 p.m. nightly. Agenda 2020 with CCCU on all major radio and television stations, 8.35 to 9.35 p.m. nightly with Communal. Prepare for impact.